Hi there, welcome to Nepi Invest. Let's talk about SG Fleet, one of a few companies on the ASX that is all about fleet management and novated leases. In fact, I can think of four of the companies that are in this space. In my opinion, a fairly mature sector right now. And I had been thinking that this area is ripe for consolidation, ripe for mergers and acquisitions. And funny enough, I was a shareholder of this company for a period of time, maybe a year or two years ago, on that theory. And then SG Fleet did acquire another company, and we'll have a look at that acquisition during this video. But I want to be fairly quick in this. Well, not quick, but I do have a lot to get through, so I won't dilly-dally on each slide. So let's get stuck into looking at SG Fleet. For full disclosure purposes, I am not a shareholder of this company. I have been uh, twice in the past, and both times I have taken profits. And that should be a hint in regards to how I think about the quality of this company. What exactly does SG Fleet do? I've sort of hinted at what they do. It's also in their name, SG Fleet. So this company is a specialist vehicle asset manager. And they also do a fair bit with Nevada leases. If you don't know, don't know what a Nevada lease, it's just an agreement between yourself, your employer, and SG Fleet that lets you choose a car you want and bundle the finance and all expected running costs into a single payment that's deducted from your salary and saves you time and money. Not only that, you also pay less income tax. So there are some benefits for consumers to take part in novated leases. And for those reasons, I am a little bit wary about these companies. And I'll talk about why I'm wary later in the video. They're also getting into electric cars. So on the right-hand side here, choosing an electric car for your Novated lease could save you even more. Discover how, click on the link. So if that does excite you, maybe go to SG Fleet website and just have a look at uh, what they are doing in regards to electric cars. The current CEO of SG Fleet is Robbie Blau, and he's been in this role for almost 17 years. Appointed the CEO of SG Fleet in July 2006. Previous to that, he was the managing director and founder of Nucleus Corporate Finance in South Africa. So Robbie Blau is a South African. Now, I can think of some positives and some negatives in regards to a CEO being in a role for about 17 years. So uh, I think the positives would be in regards to stability and some of the negatives would be in regards to future direction of the company. I would argue that it can be good bringing in some new blood who have some new ideas, but that might not be a negative if Robbie Blau is willing to listen to new ideas from management below him. And maybe he's one of those sort of CEOs. In fact, I would say that that sort of leader who is always willing to listen to those below him and take aboard those new ideas below him are the sort of uh, managers, leaders you want to be in those positions. Now onto the quality of SG Fleet. And since I have held this company a couple of times in the past, only for short to medium term, should be an idea that I wouldn't classify this company as high quality. And because I do consider this sector to be mature, I don't think there's going to be significant growth or very much growth in the future. And it's another reason I did expect a fair bit of consolidation in this space because I can think of at least four or five uh, ASX companies that are in this sector. And I've already mentioned that SG Fleet did go through the acquisition phase in the past year. And I'll talk about that later in the video. So I wouldn't expect much growth not only for SG Fleet, but for also their competitors in this space. And that's one of the reasons I wouldn't classify this company as being high quality. But if I saw some value, for instance, if I saw the P ratio of this company get down to eight or seven or maybe even nine, I would probably consider that pretty good value. And that's when I would consider taking a position in this company, not for the long term, but only for the short to medium term in the hope that the share price will rally and the P ratio would rise. So you get some multiple expansion. There is one reason I am wary of these sort of companies. And the reason I'm wary 
is perfectly illustrated to what happens with Macmillan Shakespeare back in 2013, July of that year. So we're talking about almost 10 years ago. I still remember this because Macmillan Shakespeare's share price was in a beautiful uptrend. Look at that uptrend from the start of 2012 to July 2013, share price rose from $9 to $18. Share price doubled in that period of time. And this is a classic uptrend. And then all of a sudden, on the 16th of July 2013, share price fell 15%, not because of what something the business did. So the company didn't issue any negative financial report, no profit downgrade. Company went into a trading halt. Uh, maybe I'll talk about the trading halt in the next slide. And then on the 25th of July, when they came out of the trading halt, the share price fell another 43%. So the share price fell about 60% in true trading days. In fact, the share price fell down to $7 at the low on the 25th of July. Share price did rally. I do know a lot of investors who did buy in on the 25th of July because they thought the market absolutely overreacted. So what caused this dramatic drop in Macmillan Shakespeare share price? And for those who don't know, Macmillan Shakespeare is one of SG Fleet's competitors. And this is the announcement from Macmillan Shakespeare that they released after they came out of the trading halt on the 25th of July. In fact, they requested to remain in a trading halt, but the ASX rejected them for some reason. I don't know why, because there was a lot of uncertainty and Macmillan Shakespeare wanted to move through that uncertainty. And the reason there was a lot of uncertainty was because of federal government proposed legislative changes to the treatment of fringe benefits tax on motor vehicles, which would severely impact if these changes went through the performance, the financial performance of Macmillan Shakespeare and companies like this. And not only that, these proposed changes to the treatment of fringe benefit tax on motor vehicles took Macmillan Shakespeare by surprise, and more than likely it took their competitors by surprise as well. And Macmillan Shakespeare said here that they don't consider these issues to be resolved with sufficient certainty or clarity until after the outcome of the federal election. And this is the whole reason I'm wary about these sort of companies, because who knows what the federal government is going to do with these sort of things, with the treatment of fringe benefits tax. They could decide to do this again next week, next month, next year, in two years, or never. So there is still a little bit of uncertainty in regards to how these companies perform in the medium to long term. Now onto the company's financial year 22 results at a share price of $1.83. I'm recording this video during trading on the 28th. So that share price has been hovering. In fact, on the previous trading day, the share price rose 10%. And today, the last time we looked, the share price was down 4.5%. So a fair bit of volatility right now in SG Fleet's share price. And I think there are reasons behind that, including the valuation. Mark cap of $625 million, revenue of $887 million, Profit of 60.7 million. So straight away, if you could just compare the market cap to profit, we see that the P ratio of this company is hovering around 10. And then operating cash flow, 224 million. Free cash flow, 220 million. So if you just look at the price to free cash flow, that is almost three, or actually less than three, which does sound ridiculously cheap for any company, no matter what they do. Now to the revenue history for SG Fleet. Now this company listed on the ASX in 2014 or 15. So that was after, they listed after those issues with Macmillan Shakespeare. And this company did have nice revenue growth for the first few years after they were listed entity. But between 2018 and 2021, revenue went sideways. In fact, you could argue revenue was in a down, well, I wouldn't say downward spiral, but it was decreasing at a slow rate. $515 million of revenue in 2018, down to $482 million in 2021. There was a slight dip in 2020, more than likely because of COVID-19. And then you'll see a massive jump in revenue in 2022. Revenue grew from $482 million to $887 million, And that's because of the acquisition. That's not organic growth. But if we do look at the revenue per share growth, Five, over the last five years, it's been growing at 17.5%. Over the last three years, 10.7%. And I would say the majority of that growth is because of what happened in 2022 with this acquisition. The other thing you have, I've included here is operating margins. And we have seen operating, operating margins drop over the past, say, say, five to eight years from the 35% range 
all the way down to 16.5%. And I probably would say some of that decreasing in operating margins is because of competition and because this is a mature space. One thing I wanted to know, with that increase in revenue, how much of that was because of acquisitions and how much organic growth there was? And fortunately enough, they do provide this sort of information within either in their presentation or their financial statements. So we can, or they have broken down their financial results uh, in SG Fleet and also through their acquisition of lease plan. So in financial year 21, SG Fleet only had $482 million of revenue. In financial year 2022, $494 million, while lease plan provided $393 million of revenue. So if you do look at revenue, operating EBITDA, underlying net profit, and reported net profit after tax and amortization, uh, SG Fleet did have some very limited organic growth. For instance, underlying net profit after tax grew from 51.6 million to 52.6 million. S3 Fleet is a dividend paying company. And one thing I always look for here is dividends growing through time. It did look fairly promising for S3 Fleet the first three or four years they were on the ASX from 2014 because dividends were growing and then dividends have really gone nowhere over the past three or four years. Although you could argue over the last few years, dividends have started to grow again. And if you look at the dividend yield, 7.9%. So even if this company doesn't grow, I would probably assume there's going to be some income investors who see the dividend yield and probably know that even though this is a mature market, more than likely, uh, SG Fleet won't see a significant decrease in their profit and revenue, that sort of thing. So that dividend yield could be safe moving forward. So I think as the share price of SG Fleet does fall and that dividend yield does rise, that will be attractive to quite a few income investors. I always like to see a breakdown of revenue in geography, which we'll have a look later, and also in individual sectors or segments, whatever you want to call it. And SG Fleet have done that within their notes of the financial statement. This is note number five, and they've broken down the revenue into about five different, actually about six different segments or sectors. So we've got mobility services, income, finance, commission, vehicle risk income and rental and finance income. By far, the majority of their income was created through vehicle risk income and rental and finance income. You'll notice rental and finance income grew significantly from last year, 45.9 million to 285 million in this year. And that was because of the acquisition. Vehicle risk income grew from 255 million to 375 million. So the next thing I want to know is what exactly is vehicle risk income and rental and finance income as well? The other thing here I'd like to know is what is mobility services income? Because that's over $106 million of revenue for financial year 2022. And most companies, if they do break down the revenue into those different areas, will and should provide some definitions. So SG Fleet have provided some definitions of vehicle risk income. So for example, I had no idea what this is. Income earned after the expiry of the lease is recognized when it is received or when the performance obligation, being the sale of a vehicle, transferring the risk and reward to the end buyer has been satisfied and the right to receive payment is established. The gross selling price of the vehicle is recognized as vehicle risk income and the value of the vehicle at the end of the lease period payable to the financier is recognized as vehicle risk cost of sale. The mobility services income includes product and services required to keep a vehicle on the road in a safe and compliant manner. Uh, they don't give any examples here. Well, actually they do. Registering and insuring the vehicle, providing assistance in the event of a breakdown or accident, telematics and safety inspections, and rental and finance income should be quite obvious. obvious. It's just the income earned on lease vehicles funded on the balance sheet. Rental income is generated by operating lease vehicles short-term rental vehicles, as well as subscription vehicles. And this nice little geographical breakdown of the revenue, I actually did find in Guru Focus, and I didn't know this existed. Uh, and I'm glad I found this because it's a nice little breakdown. I could have done myself, but save the time, just get this little screen grab from Guru Focus. And you can see they do have operations in three countries, Australia, New Zealand, and United Kingdom. But by far, the most of their revenue is generated in Australia. In fact, 76% of the revenue is in Australia, 
13.8% in New Zealand and 11% in United Kingdom. Probably one of the questions I had when I looked at the financial results is why was there a big discrepancy or difference between the profit and operating cash flow? In fact, in 2022, that difference was 170 million. So profit was 60.7 million, operating cash flow 230 million. So all you have to do is go to the reconciliation of profit to net cash from operating activities for SG Fleet. This was note 42 in their financial statements. And I love this uh, reconciliation because you can understand why there might be a difference between profit and operating cash flow. And for SG Fleet, it's all explained by depreciation amortization. I did have a look at which one was higher, depreciation amortization, and it's definitely depreciation. So that's because of leased vehicles, that sort of thing. The other thing I noticed here was a massive jump in depreciation amortization from last year to this year, 32.9 million to 202.6 million. Was this a one-off? So maybe next year they'll have, or go back to depreciation and amortization uh, back to like 30 to 40 million, or was this because of that acquisition of lease plan? And when I saw the history of depreciation and amortization, over the past nine years or so, uh, this really reinforced my uh, desire to understand why depreciation and amortization grew significantly for last year because historically, depreciation and amortization was fairly low for SG Fleet. In fact, the highest was in 2021 with 32.9 million. So that was my next step in researching SG Fleet. Why was there a sudden increase in depreciation and amortization? And I think I found it just in this simple um, slide within their presentation where they focused on leased motor vehicle assets and leased receivables on the left-hand side and on balance sheet funded fleet. And you'll notice a massive increase in leased motor vehicle assets from 2021, 94 million to 1.4 billion. And then on the on balance sheet funded fleet, they started the year at 4.3 um, 4,319 and finished the year at 51,669. So I think this is the reason why there was a massive jump in depreciation was because they significantly increased their lease motor vehicle assets because of this acquisition with lease plan. Now onto the valuation metrics for SG Fleet. And this is where it does get a little bit interesting for this company because this company could be argued it is fairly cheap inexpensive right now. And I don't think the market is expecting any growth from this company. And that's why the market is willing to give a bit of a discount. Uh, and that's why the dividend yield is pretty high. PE ratio is fairly low. Price of free cash flow is fairly low as well at 2.8. But PE ratio right on 10 or just above 10. Price of sales ratio 0.73. Price of free cash flow 2.8. I did do a reverse DCF on their earnings per share, not the free cash flow, because I think earnings per share is a better indication of how this company is performing. And all this company has to do is grow at 2.5%, their earnings per share at 2.5% to justify the current valuation. And I think this company can grow at 2.5% per year. And I think there is a possibility they can grow a little bit more than that, maybe 5% per year. So I think there could be some good value with SG Fleet at these sort of valuations. As I delved a little bit deeper in my research of this company, I did find some few interesting things in regard to innovation things the company is doing. They made an investment in e-bike, e-cargo, micro mobility solution provider, Zumo. So I'm not sure how they're going to incorporate that. For instance, they say here, solution to be introduced to corporate government tool of trade customers, Novated Channel. So I'm not sure how big this will be. They've also got something called eStart. I'm not sure exactly what eStart is, but they mentioned right at the bottom of the commentary, initial trial successful targeting capacity expansion. So more than likely, this has something to do electric vehicles. That is one theme I did find throughout their presentation. They're really high on ESG, particularly moving towards electric vehicles or the decarbonization of the world. So if you do like those sort of things, maybe take a closer look at SG Fleet. Now, just because the PE ratio of this company is 10.3 doesn't necessarily mean this company is good value right now. In fact, possibly the PE ratio of this company is usually around five. 
which would mean a P ratio of 10.3 is abnormally high. And then it could be argued this company is overvalued. So I always like to look at the historical P ratios of a company or the historical valuation metrics of a company to get an idea where that valuation metric should be for a company over time. So this is the P ratio history for SG Fleet going back to the start of 2016. So seven year history here. And what do we see when we look at the PE ratio history for this company? Well, back in 2016, the PE ratio of SG Fleet was hovering between 20 and 25. And then it fell from that level all the way down to a low of five during the COVID-19 financial panic. And you'll see over the last seven years, it has only fallen below 10 twice for a very brief period of time in 2019 or well, the start of that year, and then during the COVID-19 financial panic. And both times we saw the pre-ratio rebound fairly nicely, which means the share price rebounded fairly nicely. So a lot of times you will see the P-ratio and the share price of a company sort of mirror each other because this is all about multiple expansion and multiple contraction because the other driving force for the movement of a share price is financial expansion or financial contraction, profit increasing, profit dropping, but that only happens once or twice a year. Share price of a company is always changing, which means every single day or every single trade, we get multiple expansion, multiple contraction. So whenever you see the PE ratio rising, that's a period of multiple expansion. Whenever you see the PE ratio of a company dropping, that is multiple contraction. So over the past about almost two years, year and a half, we have seen multiple contraction. We have seen the P ratio of this company drop from about 21, 22 down to 10. And it's reasonable to argue that there is a chance that eventually the P ratio will start climbing for this company. And that means without any a financial expansion, you could see the share price rising. And that is one way to benefit from a rising share price just through multiple expansion. So I wouldn't rule that out. Doesn't necessarily mean it will happen, but I think right now or any time the P ratio of this company falls below 10 could be a low risk entry point for you if you are interested in this company. Now on to the charts for SG Fleet. And this is the weekly chart going back to when they listed on the ASX, which was towards the start of 2014. And remember that PE ratio history, which started about 2016. And that does, that PE ratio chart does mirror the share price fairly well. Not exactly, but fairly well. And we have seen the share price um, trending down over the past 18 months from about $3.25 down to current share price around about $1.80. Share price fell as low as about $1 during the COVID-19 financial panic. But if you compare the share price right now to when it listed on the ASX, share price has really done nothing. It's just gone sideways. So the share price when it listed was around about $1.60, $1.70. So share price has increased. And this is another reason I wouldn't classify this company as a high quality company. Because when you look at the chart, share price has not gone from the bottom left to the top right. It's really gone sideways with a bit of volatility during this period of time. And if we take a look at the daily chart here and we go back uh, to May 2021, the reason I've gone that far back is I just want to include that highs we saw in the middle of 2021 because the share price has been dropping since then. And there is a downtrend there, which is portrayed by that sloping dashed line, which connects the highs we have seen. The first high was in June of 2021. The second high was in February 2022. And the most recent high was in August. 2022. So the last two highs were around about the time the company reported. Funny that. And before the company reported, we did see a rapid rise in share price. So maybe over the next month or during January, we might see the share price of SG Fleet go on a bit of a run. If what happened the last two times the company reported, uh, it comes to fruition again. It's only a small sample size of two, but it's a possibility. But if you do take a look at this chart, particularly over the past, say, year, 14 months, 15 months, the share price is in a downtrend. And we just don't know how much further the share price of SG Fleet has to fall. I probably would suggest income investors who would be attracted to the dividend yield should be able to prop up the share price of this company. So I would expect the share price to fall much further from here 
unless the company releases an absolutely awful uh, financial report in February. I plan to continue this series for a while yet, and the next five companies I'll be featuring in NEPI analysis video series include Premium Investors, which is the next video I'll do, Kogan, Advanced, Zingtech Limited, and then a company I know very little about, has a very low market, but is profitable and does provide the shareholders a dividend, and that is GLG Corp, or Jim Gim Lee Group of Companies, and Coden, and that's all because of requests from two viewers of this, um, of this channel who actually requested Coden back-to-back in a video. I can't remember what exactly the video was, but because they did request Coden back-to-back, I thought I will give them uh, analysis of Coden because the share price of that company has decreased significantly over the past year. So if you do have a suggestion of a company you'd like me to feature in this video series, just leave that suggestion, that's a request in the comment section of this video. That's all I have for this look at SG Fleet. If you do have any thoughts about this company, maybe you're a shareholder and you'd like to maybe correct some mistakes I've made about this company, leave those in the comment section of this video. Otherwise, I'm not a financial advisor. If you do need financial advice, make sure you seek out someone who is qualified and can speak to your own financial needs. That's it for this video. Have a good day. Bye.